In this video, I'm going to show you how to use your camera like a professional filmmaker by guiding you through the manual settings in order to get the most cinematic look you possibly can. And we're starting right Part of being a filmmaker is understanding how to use your camera to get the best possible image out of it. And in this case, a cinematic image. Sorry, I, sh I should do that with, I should make more of an effort. Hang on, one, one, one second. Right, let's begin. Understanding manual mode on your camera needn't be difficult. In fact, there's only five things you really need to understand in order to look and sound like you know what you're talking about. So here they are. Number one is frame rate. Now every camera is gonna give you the option of what frame rate you wanna shoot in. And to get the most cinematic look, that look that you see when you go to the cinema or you watch something on Netflix, you're gonna to wanna to pick 24 frames per second. Anything other than 24 frames per second isn't gonna look very good. In fact, it's gonna look like... Invitation to Love, starring Martin Padley as Chet. Anything that's shot to look legitimately cinematic is shot at 24 frames per second. But do you know what else looks super cinematic these days? Slow motion. And to get that super slow motion cinematic effect, then you're going to want to up your frame rate to either 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second. Now I could say a higher frame rate, but at the minute when you get a camera that does that, it usually decreases the resolution at which you can shoot at, which you don't want at all. Now I know I said that anything other than 24 frames per second doesn't look particularly shit. But if you capture something with the idea of it being in slow motion at 60 or 120 frames per second and throw it into your editing program later, you can slow it down, play it at 24 frames per second and get a really beautifully smooth cinematic look. The second thing we need to talk about is ISO. Now, ISO as a function is kind of crazy and I'll tell you why in a second. Firstly, you're going to want to find the ISO as a button somewhere on your camera. If it's a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, it will be an actual physical button that you can press most of the time. And when you press this button, you're going to see a series of numbers flash up on the screen, starting from a very low number like 50 all the way up to what the hell does my camera go up to? 204,800. Now the ISO is kind of like magic light because what it will do is find light where there is no light. For example, if I were to turn off this light here right now, everything gets rather dark. If I were to then turn off the lights behind me as well, and the front one. Now this is a fairly accurate depiction of what the light is now like in this room. However, if I press the ISO button and start going up through the ISO numbers, you'll see that my camera tries to find as much light as it possibly can in order to give me a really, really bright picture. That's at ISO 102, 102,400 <laughs> right now, and it's really bright. There are currently no artificial lights on in this room, and there's just the light coming slightly through the blinds, so that's quite incredible. So you're probably thinking to yourself, why don't people just use ISO whenever they have any trouble controlling light in a shop? Well, it's because the magic of ISO comes at a price, and that is the higher the ISO number, the more grainy and noisy your footage becomes. If I were just to place my shirt in front of the picture now, you'd see it's quite noisy, it's quite busy, there's lots of movement, and that's because the ISO is so high. So what we try and do is reduce our ISO down to the bare minimum we need it in order to get the light we want. So whilst ISO is really good at finding light where you didn't think there was any, there's nothing more uncinematic than cheap looking footage that's grainy or noisy. So keep the ISO as low as you possibly can. Is that good? Now you can also control the amount of light coming into your camera by adjusting the shutter speed. Shutter speed can be adjusted by one of the wheels or dials on the back of your camera if you're using a DSLR. The shutter speed will appear as a number on your viewfinder and that number will look like a one with a fraction line and then another number next to it. The one stands for one second, the other number stands for a fraction of that second. Now shutter speed determines how long the shutter is open and closed for, and you can imagine the longer the shutter is open, the more light that's let in, the shorter the time the shutter is open, the less light that is pulled in. When you leave the shutter speed open for a long time, what you're gonna end up with is a huge amount of motion blur. Because as you film things that are moving, the shutter speed remains remains open and is trying to capture all that data at the same time. For example, if I choose to set my shutter speed at something rather low, like 1 15th of a second, let's do that on this camera now, yes it gets brighter, 
but then as I wave my hands, all the motion I'm capturing in my shot now has this weird blurry effect. Not very cinematic. Same is true if I shoot something with a much higher shutter speed. Let's say for instance, one thousandth of a second. I will move my shutter speed up to one thousandth. Yes, it's very dark. So if I compensate that by turning up the ISO, then what I get, instead of blurriness when I move my hands in front, I get this very sharp looking effect where you see every single detail at an incredibly quick speed. That doesn't look cinematic either. So you're probably asking yourself, when it comes to shutter speed, is there a magic number you can use in order to get the most cinematic feel? And the answer is, yeah. The best shutter speed you can use in order to get something that doesn't look too blurry or too sharp is to select the shutter speed that is twice the amount of the frames per second you're using. So in most cases, when you're shooting at 24 frames per second, your shutter speed should be around 1 48th of a second, 1 slash 4 8. And then of course, if you've decided to shoot something in slow motion, you're gonna have to up that shutter speed depending on the frame rate you're shooting at. So 60 frames per second means a shutter speed of 120th of a second, 1 slash 1 2 0. And shooting at 120 frames per second means selecting a shutter speed of 240th of a second. That's 1 slash 2 4 0. But the other thing to remember is that when it comes to shooting your film, there might be situations where you want to change up that shutter speed, where you might want something at a very blurry kind of pace, or you might want something at a very sharp, quick pace. It's all up to you and what it is you want to instill in your audience when you're filming. For example, a very blurry, very long shutter speed was used in the new Matrix movie, where Morpheus took the red pill and it started to have a strange effect on him and his reality. Whilst very short shutter speeds are often used in action sequences, whether that be in war films like Saving Private Ryan, or even in TV shows like The Walking Dead. Now there's also a third important way you can control light from your camera. This is through the aperture. Now, unlike ISO and shutter speed, which are controlled through your camera, the aperture is actually controlled through the lens we're using. Aperture is again controlled usually by a wheel or a dial on your camera and is seen on your display screen as a number that starts with an F. These numbers are actually known as F stops. The lower this number is, the wider the aperture and the more light the camera lets in, the higher the number, the less light it lets in. Now, not all lenses have the same scope of f-stops. In fact, the lower the number the f-stop goes, the more expensive a lens is likely to be. For instance, the lens on this camera now goes all the way down to f2.8, but there is another version of this lens available for twice the price that goes down to 1.4. Do you need a lens that's twice the price of a 2.8 going all the way down to 1.4? Maybe you do. The chances are if you're just starting out, you probably don't. What you can do with just a little bit of money is purchase that lens at 2.8 and then get yourself some additional lights that will also help to light up your scene and not cost you twice as much as the very expensive lens you've already forked out for. Now I know what you're probably thinking to yourself is, Paul, if I've already got the ISO and the shutter speed, why do I even need the aperture as a third option when it comes to controlling light out of my camera? Well, it's because aperture, like the other two components, does something else too. And that is, it controls the depth of field of your focus. This means that if you have the aperture wide open, let's say on this lens at f2.8, if I place something quite close to the lens and bring it into focus, then everything out of focus looks nice and dreamy and blurry. That is a shallow depth of field brought on by a wide aperture. Now, if I close the aperture down on my camera, which I'm gonna do right now by changing the f-stop value, if I bring my character in and I start to bring the f-stops up, I think I'm gonna to have to compensate by bringing the ISO up too, you'll see that while my character remains in focus, everything else around also remains much sharper than it did before. So a low f-stop, aperture wide open, everything's nice, dreamy, blurry, cinematic. A higher f-stop means that aperture is much smaller and the focal field is much wider. The very last thing you have to think about 
is white balance. But to set your white balance properly, what you're gonna need is one of these, a gray card. You can pick one up on Amazon for around about 10 bucks. Now every camera has a different way of doing this, but if you go into your menu settings or look through the manual or find a YouTube video about your specific camera that shows you this already, because I'm sure it already exists, you'll be able to use your gray card to select exactly what the white balance should be on your camera. What does this mean? Well, white balance basically allows you to set the correct colors on your camera. So nothing will be too warm, for example, and nothing will be too cool either. Then when you get into post, you don't have to worry about different lighting setups having affected your footage differently in terms of color. Because if you continue to set your white balance, depending on the lights you're using and the place you're in, you're always gonna get a solid place from which to start when it comes to color. But whilst these five things are gonna give you complete control over the camera you're shooting with, that cinematic look you're after is also dependent on what's going on in front of the camera, as well as what's going on behind it too. And to find out how to master those skills, click on this video now. I'll see you there. Thanks for watching, filmmaker.